Well, I don't know if you can see behind me, but uh, autumn's coming on. The weather is getting colder. It's having an effect on the Tup, who is uh, now making a better job of his job out here on the hill with these uh, shearlings. First time they've been to the ram. And the trees are beginning to shed their leaves. The colour is changing. Everything is uh, heading into autumn. And the trouble with heading into autumn is that it can have a bit of an effect on us too. Day length gets shorter. And we get into, if we're not very careful, we get into a bit of an autumnal mood. So here's a little something that I'm uh, putting together. I'm going to be back in the cabin doing this because it's getting colder and colder out here on this hill. Uh, about autumnal mood and how we should be looking to be a positive influence on those around us. As the days shorten, the shadows lengthen, the weather gets cold and it can definitely affect the way that we think and react and respond. Oh, it's cold out here now. Can you see my nose going red? I'm hopping back inside to have a look at John chapter 7. John 1 introduced Jesus to us as the eternal creator God. Alongside God the Father and the awesome Son of Man from Daniel 7. John 2 showed us at the wedding in Cana of Galilee that this eternal, awesome, incarnate God was ready to use his sovereign power to relieve his people's shame. And John 3 shows us that this way of his, that he's teaching and describing and recommending to us, preaching to us, stands apart from even the religion of the top Jewish religious people, their highly ethical belief in the one true historically revealing himself sort of God. That religion won't work, you must be born again in fulfilment of the Old Testament prophecies of at least Ezekiel and Jeremiah. And then John 4 comes along and shows us the supremacy of Christ's way to competing, deviating patterns of belief Revealing and bringing light to the immorality into which those patterns of belief led, those deviant patterns of belief, but also revealing the determination of the eternal and incarnate creator God to, to bring his deviating and wayward people back to himself, the fountain of living waters who they had forsaken, as Jeremiah described things. And then John 5 showed us the way that he deals with superstition, folk religion, that holds hope of healing just out of the reach of that desperately crippled man by the pool of Bethsaida. The message all along has been that what we manage in our own human strength has the inadequacy of our human nature behind it. And, and John 6 then makes that message explicit. We needed the God revealed in the flesh of chapter 1 because, as chapter 6 put it, the Spirit is the one who gives life. Human nature is of no help. The words that I've spoken to you, says Jesus, are spirit and are life. How does that work? We're going to see how that works, but first, there's a warning not to be deterred from seeking Jesus for this. He is the one. Because there are people in John 7 who just choke on this come and drink thing that Jesus has got to say. For starters, the leaders of the Jews, chapter 7 verse 1, are so alienated by Jesus and his teaching that far from just condemning him, they're very keen to get their hands on him so they can kill him. Who believe in such a startling religious teacher as Jesus when even the experts more than condemned him, they want to get their hands on him himself, themselves and, and kill him? Well, that's the big question. And it's worse than that, because although Jerusalem was abuzz about Jesus, it was now dangerous to even debate the question about him. So Jesus goes up to the feast in Jerusalem. And as he goes up there, he does something startling and striking in the temple in Jerusalem. On the last day of the feast, the greatest day, Jesus stood up and shouted out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. For as the scripture says, from within him will flow rivers 
of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were going to receive. But the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Those words in John 7, 37 to 39, very striking indeed. The point is this. Jesus had gone to the feast. What's that about? There'd been quite a kerfuffle around Jesus and his brothers had told him to go up to the temple at the big festival that was coming up. There were three feasts of the Jews, as we know. Jesus used to go up to them, as was his habit. And on this occasion, his brothers, perhaps they were confused because he seemed to be dragging his feet a bit about making arrangements for the trip. They, um, they said, come on, let's go up to the feast. You know, you're doing well. Make a name for yourself in Jerusalem now. He refrained. He wouldn't go. And then about halfway up through the feast, he went up to Jerusalem and uh, began to teach. And then on the last and the final day of the feast, he stood up and said, come to me and drink. There is a feast of the Jews known as the Feast of Tabernacles. It celebrated the Lord dealing graciously with his wayward people as they wandered in the desert wastes as a result of their obedience, having been led out of Egypt, land of slavery, land of captivity. They'd been redeemed from that land of slavery and they sinned and they rebelled against God's delivering hand. And therefore they wandered grumblingly in the desert for 40 years. God graciously loving, caring for them all along the way. And this feast was to remember God's faithfulness to them as they lived in booths or tabernacles, temporary shelters, recalling the days of their desert wandering. It was celebrated in the autumn after the harvest, so particularly relevant at this time of year. And as he goes up there, there's argument about Jesus. The, the town is divided, the city is divided uh, in opinion about him. They tried to seize him, they couldn't. There's violent, murderous opposition, as well as hopeful faith and expectation. And the broken world's response to the Saviour God come in the flesh is as broken as the broken world is. But on that last day of this Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus spoke up and he spoke up loudly. According to the Mishnah, there were ceremonies. There were ceremonies that involved taking a golden pitcher with the priests in a procession out to a water source outside the city and then back up through the water gate. Yeah, there you go, the water gate. Back into the city and then there was procession around the temple and so on and, and shouting of joy, of deliverance from the hand of God. You can hear more about it on the podcast, the radio podcast on Buzzsprout if you'd like to. And at that point, the day after, the day that they weren't doing that anymore, Jesus cried out. Jesus stood up and cried out, saying, what does he say? There's been some discussion of all of this. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. And let the one who believes in me drink. Just as the scripture says, from within him will flow rivers of living water. Now, certainly Jesus picks up on the literal water used in the ceremony. He uses it figuratively. But what does the figure mean? According to popular understanding, backed up by verse 39 of John 7, it refers to the coming of the Holy Spirit to dwell in the believer. But which particular Old Testament passage is Jesus referring to? It's an open question. People suggest Isaiah 58, 11. The Lord will continually lead you. He will feed you even in parched regions. You see, remembering the wilderness wanderings. He'll give you renewed strength and you'll be like a well-watered garden, like a spring that continually produces water. Terribly good. Or Proverbs 4, 23, or Proverbs 5, 15, or Isaiah 44, 3, Isaiah 55, 1. Come, whoever's thirsty, come without money, buy, drink. You know the passage, Isaiah 55. I reckon it, yeah, may well also recall Ezekiel 47, verses 1 following. The stuff about the water coming out of the temple, living water. Joel 3, 18, Zechariah 13, 1, 14, 8. But the meaning in this case is that when anyone comes to believe in Jesus, the scriptures 
referring to the activity of the Holy Spirit in a person's life are fulfilled. When the believer comes to Christ and drinks, says Leon Morris, he not only slakes his thirst, but receives such an abundant supply that veritable rivers flow from him. In other words, the believer himself becomes the source of living water. Now that's got some pretty big implications for us. There are those who balk at that. There, there, there are those, and there, there are manuscripts, later manuscripts, that, that, that can hardly bring themselves to say that. That it is out of the believer, then, that the Spirit flows, this water of life. I don't balk at it, because that's exactly what Jesus offered the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman of all people, in John chapter 4. And, of course, she goes off and finds the people of her village and brings them to Jesus as this living water that he promised starts to flow out of her too. So what's being said here? Here explicitly, in John 7.38, Jesus comes to the promise. Now there's that invitation we've been looking at in verse 37, the beginning of verse 38. But, but halfway then through verse 38, the promise becomes very explicit. Just as the scripture says, from within him will flow rivers of living water. There's a promise. Explicitly, John records Jesus saying, Hopistuon es ime, that is the one believing in me. It's true what he's promising here, but it's true from the one who goes on believing in me. No historic walk to the front of a large meeting. No mere transaction with a, a specially appointed counsellor with a badge. No mere praying the prayer one time in your bedroom. No one-off inclination but a reorientated life a life that continues to be lived out leaning on Jesus don't be a drip stream a river stream a river there's the difference between a drip and a water source you see and this is what Wales lacks and what Jesus is talking about here. The one believing in me, out of him will flow a river. Not a drip. A source of life-giving water. That's what Wales lacks. The one believing in me, as the scriptures have said. Well, Jesus is summarizing scripture. What is written? across these various scriptures in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Micah, whatever it is, wherever it is, whichever ones you're going to pick up. What is written? Potamoi ek tes koilias autu resusen. Rivers will flow from their guts, it says. Now hang on. The root of this word is koilia, which the concordance has defined as, yes, literally the belly and so on and so on but also metaphorically the innermost parts of a man, the soul, the heart as the seat of thought and feeling and choice. From the innermost soul of the person leaning their whole weight all the time full on Jesus, out of that person flows potamoi, rivers, not drips, not trickles, not water courses or drainage ditches, but out of the believing belly flows rivers of living waters. Waters that give life, as we saw in chapter 4 with the sinful Samaritan woman at the well, as we saw in Ezekiel 47. Rivers that flow out and bring life wherever they go into desert places. You see, with that woman at the well in John 4, that same day, the waters of life Jesus gave her were flowing out to bring life to many others in her village who saw full well both what she'd been and what she'd become. And that's the mechanism that brought them to Jesus. Are we still missing the point? Just in case, John brings us an explanation so we're clear on it. Let me take you back to the Gospel according to Ezekiel. Mm, yes, the Gospel according to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 37, there's the valley of dry bones, death everywhere. No hope, I mean no life, I mean that's not going to get up and walk and dance about, is it? No, of course not. They're dead bones, dried in the desert heat. But Ezekiel call, is called by God to prophesy to those bones. Son of man, can these bones live? No, of course they can't live. Oh, prophesy to the bones. They come alive. 
Wherever the river flows, it brings life. Ezekiel 39, God promises to deliver his people and pour out his spirit on them. And then Ezekiel is given his fly through tour of the restored temple, the dwelling place of God, which goes on for a number of chapters until in chapter 43, the glory of the Lord returns to his temple. It's a great day. The focus on the coming king, who we now know is Jesus. And then there's more architectural tour around the temple for, for, for Ezekiel from the, the angel who guides him around and shows him the changed situation. Until the service of God's atonement and worship are then reinstated in that temple, in chapters 45 and 46, and then in chapter 47. Then it says, he brought me back to the entrance of the temple. I noticed that water was flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east, and the water was flowing down from under the right side of the temple, from south of the altar. And he led me out by way of the north gate and brought me around the outside of the outer gate that faces towards the east. I noticed that the water was trickling out from the south side. And when the man went out toward the east with a measuring line in his hand, he measured 1,750 feet. And then he led me through water, which was ankle deep. And again, he measured 1,750 feet and led me through the water, which was now knee deep. And again, he measured 1,750 feet and led me through the water, which was waist deep. And again, he measured 1,750 feet and it was a river I could not cross, for the water had risen. It wasn't too deep to swim in, a, a river that couldn't be crossed. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And then he led me back to the bank of the river. And when I returned, I noticed a vast number of trees on the banks of the river on both sides. And he said to me, these waters go out toward the eastern region and flow down into the Arabah. When they enter the Dead Sea, where the sea is stagnant, the waters become fresh. Every living creature that swarms where the river flows will live. There'll be many fish for these waters flow there. It'll become fresh and everything will live where the river flows. And the entire vision of Ezekiel is conveyed in metaphor and imagery. It's a revelatory dream he received, sitting beside a drainage ditch as a captive exiled to Babylon on his 30th birthday, the day he should have been getting inducted into the Levitical priesthood at the conquered and now derelict temple in Jerusalem. And he gets this vision. Let's cut to the chase. That river, that slow trickle growing in depth as it grows in distance, growing incrementally as it moves from the threshold of the visionary temple out into the barren wilderness, giving life wherever it goes. That river is the flood of living water that streams, streams, floods, river-like, not drip-like, out of the souls of the people who believe. The people who rest their lives moment by moment on the awesome Son of Man, the eternal Creator God, who came here as Jesus and who, when he's lifted up, draws all mankind to himself, but only as we lean our whole weight, livingly, on Jesus. We've seen it already in that woman of Samaria. Jesus proclaims it now in John 7 at that uh, festival of God's grace, during sin-induced wilderness wandering, the Feast of Tabernacles, and he promises this to wanderers yet, to his wanderers yet. Don't be a drip. Stream a river. So is that what's flowing from you? It's his to give. Get it, get it from him. It's his, and he gives it you if you lean on him and lean your weight and live your life leaning your weight on him, not being a perfect person, but staking it all on Jesus. There's the critical factor in your weakness. Is it Jesus you're staking it on? There's the question. There's the challenge of this. The call is to put all your chips on Jesus so that his life-giving water flows into you and on from you, now the temple of his Holy Spirit, because that's what you become, off into the dry, barren wilderness of our world, giving his life wherever it goes. There's the way to be living through water. Streaming Jesus into you, leaning your whole weight on him. And then streaming him out from you. 
Leaves die and fall from trees, and people's mood and attitude is affected. You drink Jesus, and drinking him, you flow his life-giving life out of you, wherever he takes you. God bless us with that experience this autumn, for his glory. Thank you.